I decided to call this show Trap Happy after um, one of the particular pieces in this show with the same name. This concept came about in March of 2022 when I helped out for a couple of days with this field biology class at Kansas State University that was studying non-migratory songbirds out at Kansas Prairie Biological Station um, near Manhattan. Um, this, the work there involved getting to the field site before dawn, and this was in March, so it was like very, very cold. <laughs> And we would work in teams to set up these huge nets on poles um, set up among the brush. These nets were very fine and wispy with a lot of give. Um, and they were about 10 feet tall, maybe 12 feet long. These were how the researchers caught the songbirds uh, for tagging and measurement. And it was really cool to be part of that team for a few days. And I was impressed by how very careful and mindful the researchers were of the birds uh, to remove them really gently from the nets and not stress them out too much. Um, but anyway, it was on one of these trips to Kanza that I learned the term trap happy from one of the biologists on the team. Uh, so trap happy refers to an animal that keeps returning and getting caught in the trap over and over again. Um, this kind of thing usually happens when there's food involved, when the trap is somehow baited with treats. Um, but there wasn't any kind of food incentive involved with this particular study, so there wouldn't be any obvious reason for birds to be attracted back to the nets in the same place. But apparently uh, this happened anyway sometimes. The researchers um, would tag the birds that they caught with these little bands around their legs so they could tell how many times the bird had been caught. So this concept of being trap happy was really interesting to me, um, especially in this case when the cause wasn't readily obvious. Plus the phrase trap happy just has a great ring to it. <laughs> so I started a drawing of a net inspired by the bird nets that the researchers used. Um, it was such an interesting object in itself. Um, but I also started thinking about my work over the past decade and what things I have come back to again and again. You know, what am I sort of trap happy for? <laughs> so there's obviously a variety of work in this show, but um, one project I'll talk a little bit more about that I felt drawn to revisit um, was this large-scale handmade paper. And I started exploring paper making in 2015 with totally handmade materials uh, and working in my backyard. I had a very DIY approach to the whole thing and I was not interested in making paper that was very perfect or usable as writing or drawing surface. Um, I was more interested in the paper as almost like a sculptural element, even though I do love working on paper and I am actually still creating these handmade papers into really big sheets, basically. Um, but I just wanted the paper itself to be enough on its own. Um, I also can't get over the, the surface of the paper being a metaphor for land. Uh, even though the sheets themselves are very large, they're pieced together in individual panels that are still somewhat visible. You can see the seams. So it's, it's basically a rough grid, uh, sort of like how land gets divided and parceled out in individual land ownership situations, even though that land is part of a larger body. There's also history and time embedded in the paper. The pulp that I use is made from recycled paper that's left to sit in an open container outside, uh, collecting detritus from the environment that it's in. So you can see there are subtle color differences depending on what was in the paper batch that I used, but there's also a ton of little particles embedded in the paper too. Leaves, flies, seeds, twigs, since I made that first really big sheet of paper in 2015, 
I have moved at least eight times, including two out-of-state moves. <laughs> I never put that sheet in any sort of shows or did anything with it that made it feel complete, but I also couldn't get rid of it. <laughs> but it's so big and awkward to move, it's hard to transport well, and I just started referring it to it in my own head as my paper burden. <laughs> but I believed in it for some reason. I believed that I would come back to it one day knowing that I, knowing that it would need mending. Um, and so that's, that's what I did. In 2022, <laughs> I pulled my paper burden out of the basement <laughs> and set about to mending it and making some more paper. Um, Unfortunately, when I pulled it out, I realized there was um, a lot more work to do on it than I had remembered. It was pretty torn up. So the paper adventure continued, and I tried various ways to patch up the rips and the holes. And again, not in a tidy, inconspicuous way, but it, in a very visible way. And I think again about land here. I live in the Flint Hills of Kansas where the tall grass prairie is in various states of neglect or active management. But it's very hard to replace healthy native prairie once it's been destroyed. Um, there are lots of good folks here doing restoration work on lands across the state, but it's not always a pretty process to behold, especially in the early stages of that, and it takes a lot of time, a lot of work, and a lot of patience to cultivate. So those are some of the things that I was thinking about while mending my giant paper. Thanks. <laughs>